make sure you had the, uh, the background, one observation. We have several observations this morning, and a br brilliant morning to everyone who is joining the conversation also too. And just in time, we count down to the general elections. Uh, we've talked a lot about presidential elections, but very importantly, the governorship election, which will happen on the 11th of March. That's two weeks after the presidential election, where we have uh, at least 28 states. Eight of them would be, would be happening because of legal issues. Yeah. So we go, call yeah. them the off-season off, off, off off elections. Off elections. Yeah. But 28, and one of them will be here this morning, or is here already. Uh, talk about the prospects. So, it's a pleasure to have us welcome Funsho Duhati, the Thank you. governorship candidate of uh, ADC. Uh, African Democratic Congress yes. is what the ADC stands for. And um, it's a pleasure to have you join us this morning, Mr. Thank Duhati. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Uh, all right, um, so uh, let's, let's begin. I haven't read through your, your resume. And, mm. um, we did, we did observe that you are a, you are a computer maker, <laughs> but, but that, that for me is not the interest. The interest is the fact that I notice you've been in the, the financial service system, you've been mm -hmm. in the pension, yes. uh, uh, the pension um, sector of the economy. Yeah. Uh, why politics for you? So, um, as you rightly observed, I've had a 30-year track record in the private sector before making this transition. Yeah. And... Um, it's not unusual, as you know, in other climes for folks after a successful career in the private sector to move into public service. But more specifically for me, um, my motivation is driven by the recognition that I have, and I think that many people have, that a lot of the issues that we face um, as a people stems from a failure of leadership and an absence of, or maybe a death of um, leadership, of character, and competence. Um, and um, in that vacuum, in a democratic context, the only way you get to good governance is if people who have something to contribute uh, and who have that track record and can bring that character of governance uh, step up and offer themselves for service and the people make their choice. Um, and I think that part of the reason why we've had an apathy problem, voter apathy problem in the past, is because people perhaps feel that they're not presented with sufficient choices to choose from. And so in a democratic context, the only way, um, the only way you get to that is if people step up and if the people carry them. And I feel that this is an area where I can contribute given what I have done, uh, given also my own sense of the gap between where we are and where we ought to be developmentally. Um, and so I made the decision to, to make the transition. You know, it's interesting you, you mentioned two things which significantly strikes uh, the heart of Lagos. One, apathy. Lagos got one of the worst numbers of voters in um, this fourth republic. It's actually the worst. Know the worst. Yeah. We sometimes Across all the states, yeah. 16 percent, 17 percent. And then you say also, interestingly, that uh, the bane of the problem uh, is leadership. It's why people are pathetic towards uh, having to vote. Yeah. But interestingly, Lagos over the years has prided itself like sort of the proverbial city on the hill, mm. you know, compared to its other peers. They haven't been able to measure up. And I mean, I was just looking at the last one about the IGR yeah. and Lagos and Delta and the FCT top yes. the states that have putting a lot of money. So why, why do you think uh, leadership is a problem if the government in Lagos would argue mm. that we are the best among the rest? <laughs> so um, there are a couple of things uh, I would say in response to that. First of all, um, the way you measure the um, quality or effectiveness of leadership um, is not on an absolute scale. You have to look at it in relation to what are the resources that those leaders have had to deploy, all right? And I think if you measure Lagos by, by that metric, you will see that it is far more endowed than most other states. And therefore, it, is almost, it almost goes without saying that you should see a greater level of development. The question is, to what extent do you see that development? And is it commensurate with the resources that have been deployed? It's almost like the parable of the, of the talents right, uh, the biblical parable of the talents and the man who was given 10, um, ten talents. Uh, the idea is not to compare yourself with the man who got five 
talents, right? Uh, the question is, if, what else could someone else have done with the 10 talents that you were given? To bring this all home, there's a summary metric which I think is worth looking at. Um, you may have seen recently that the Economist Intelligence Unit, which is a unit of the Economist magazine, which does an annual global ranking of cities, recently released a ranking of cities across the globe. They ranked 172 cities. Lagos was ranked 171 out of 172. In other words, the last but one. And what is this ranking? It basically looks at five areas. Health, education, infrastructure, culture and environment, and stability in terms of financial stability. So it's a comprehensive metric. So that tells you that when you measure Lagos to other comparable cities across the globe, it leaves a lot to be desired. And ultimately, if you've had essentially one ruling party ruling that entity for 25 years, there's only one way you can interpret the outcome of that. And I think it's not by looking at you know, X, Y, Z state in Nigeria and saying, I am better off than this. It's about asking yourself, what resources have you deployed? And what quality of life have you delivered to your citizens with those resources in relation to what you could have done? And I think that this is where Lagos falls, far short of where it ought to be. Dorothy, what would you do differently <clears throat> from what we see in Lagos? I mean, like, like we've all established, Lagos did pride itself as an infrastructure state. I mean, if you go across Lagos today, you can see um, massive infrastructure work going, going on across Lagos. I mean, I had the misfortune of finding myself on Awolo Road yesterday. I didn't even know where I was going to. I was headed for GROA from um, the shop right angle. And then I said, let me drive straight to Awolo Road and I'll navigate. Um, and then I got there, I was like, wow, what's happening here? But I missed my way. I had to make a detour, mm. turn around, go through a computer village mm. to find my way there. So massive construction work going on across um, Lagos State. Uh, what do you find wrong uh, in um, the works that the state government is doing? And what would you have done differently? So, I mean, there's, there's so much um, to speak about. Um, but if I take the road infrastructure, which or transportation infrastructure, infrastructure which yeah. is what you just talked about, and yeah. as you know, infrastructure has many dimensions. If you take the infrastructure uh, dimension, Lagos has one of the highest commute times in the world. With commute times comes a number of other complexities, right? It's not just time and inconvenience, but there are health consequences. There's air quality, there's culture and environment, right? So there are real human costs associated with these things. Yes, there is evidence of expenditure on roads, on rail. But what is the quality of that expenditure? What is the strategic thinking underlying it? Is, are we deploying the resources in the best possible way? I'll give you some examples. First, we've been doing a rail project for 15 years. It's just one axis of travel, right? We have not delivered that rail. Have we asked ourselves, what is the accountability and transparency around that? Why have we not delivered it? Other countries have had similar programs and have delivered them and moved on to, to other things. We're still here struggling with, with, with that one thing which has not been delivered. If you take the roads, Lagos is a coastal city. Not only is it a coastal city, we have the lagoon that runs pretty much across the state. So the road infrastructure is really just one element of the transportation infrastructure that we could use in a city like Lagos. I have lived in a coastal city in a developed country. And in my office where I worked, people came by ferry, some came by rail, some came by road in our same office. And it didn't depend on how much you earned. It depended on what was comfortable for you. So rather than spending money with full focus on the road infrastructure, more could have been done, for example, to develop waterways, taking key routes to decongest key routes on the, on the roads. Then finally, and I can talk for a lot longer on this, but just to make two or three points. Finally, on the road infrastructure itself, there is basically a preponderance of chaos and disorder on Lagos roads. And that contributes to the problems that we face. 
It's not just the building of the infrastructure, but even the infrastructure that you have. If people are not orderly, if people, if you have touts basically taking up um, um, portions of the road, if you have people who um, take up one lane out of or two lanes out of a three lane road, the infrastructure may never be enough. Right, you may continue to build infrastructure and it may never be enough. You won't even get the best use of the existing infrastructure that you have. One of the problems that we have and that we think needs to be fixed in Lagos is that some of those agents of disorder on our roads uh, almost have too cozy a relationship, in fact, not almost, they have too cozy a relationship with the leadership of the state. Right, because they deliver political favors for them. They deliver, and this is the period, this is the season. Right? Got the, the, the ruling, uh, uh, the leaders ride to power on the backs of those entities. And therefore, it's difficult for them to, they are basically part of the power structure of the state. And we think that that needs to be broken. Because some of those things need to be curbed. But if you are beholden to them, you will not be in a position to do it. It's interesting your viewpoints on uh, traffic and transportation planning. You know, Lagos once described as a city uh, that cannot stop growing. I mean, so we have a strict demand um, and very fewer supply. I mean, the BRT head once said, we asked for, for, for 3,000 buses to be able to make sense of the congestion, but mm. we only have about 300, 400 buses. So you can do the arithmetic and see why we have more people waiting at the bus stops than uh, in those vehicles, actually. But Take you back and put you on the spot. On, I, I like your description of what you call agents of disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, so they took out some of the agents of disorder and they claimed, the state government, that it was due to uh, public, overriding public interest, which was with the Okadas and some of the Keke, and moved them out. And they've had reviews over time to suggest that people were happy with it. But then these agents of, dis of disorder, the Agbiros on the street, you say it has to be broken. You're saying that you're going to kick them out and say, no more, it's business over for them. We're saying that, you see, um, unions, right, um, because they, 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 sort of, um, they sort of present themselves as you know, a, a, a union body, right, which, which acts in the interest of, right. Um, and there's nothing wrong with unions, right, per se. However, you will find that some of the, the, um, the, the operators of whom they are a, a union are themselves victims of even the leaderships of, this, of, this, of these unions, right? And some of them are almost extorted by these folks on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, we are saying, and if you look at some of their activities, they are actually dangerous on the roads. If you come on the Lekki Road, you will see them running around in traffic harassing the um, uh, commercial drivers, getting in the way of moving vehicles, causing people to swerve and those kinds of, all those kinds of things are not acceptable and will curb them, right? Now, valid unions and their union leadership can operate in accordance with the laws that govern their operation. That is fine. But you cannot operate in a way as to create a public nuisance on, on Lagos roads. And where your actions infringe on the rights of citizens, and indeed on the rights of those whom you pur purport to represent as union leaders, we will rise up as a government in defense of, of the people and in, and in, in defense of, of the individuals uh, uh, that you are essentially uh, suppressing and oppressing. And we will do it. We will, not be, we will not be shy. And you know why we will be able to do it? Because if we succeed, it is the people who would have made that choice. It is the people who would have made the choice in 2023 to say that, look, we're tired of this, right? So we, the broader people, are going to choose the leaders that we want, right? So we are not going to ride to power on the back of a block vote of Agberos. We're going to ride to power if the people decide to go with us on the backs of the people. And therefore, we'll represent the people's interest. Mm -hmm. So we have no problem doing that. Now, there are, uh, it's not that we are unmindful of the fact that um, there is a, we have a, a, uh, an unemployment problem in Lagos. 
and some of these guys are, are it's a way of keeping some of these guys um, active. You consider that employment? I don't consider it. Act, I don't consider it employment. But I'm saying that these folks, if you if you bring in reforms hmm. that break some of these things, you know, government is holistic thinking. So you don't go and do something without thinking about how you ameliorate or how you um, uh, mitigate uh, the effects of the actions that you take. And so we'll have those, those, those types of uh, mitigating. We, um, when, when you talk about reforms of this set of individuals, uh, I'm just I'm racking my head. I'm thinking how, what kind of reform can come into play here. These are uh, a large number of those individuals, uh, they lack skills. They lacked um, education. Uh, uh, they are probably what we call their streetwise individuals. So what kind of reform do you think um, you can bring uh, to the fore, uh, you know, to, to just address the issues? So I think that, you know, there are short and long term solutions um, that we'll have to deploy to this problem. Part of it actually stems from even from the educational system. Um, one of our central themes is that. Um, we will reform the curriculum of vocational system. And as part of that, we will expand the vocational options that are available as part of the educational system because not everybody is going to get an office job, not everybody is suited to an office job. And we have to in, 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 increase the range of options that people can engage with uh, and, and provide um, employment. Related to that are our policies around ease of doing business. So we want to make life a lot easier for the small businesses and the medium-sized businesses. These are the people who employ two, three, four people. In an economy like Lagos, as in similar economies across the world, those are the businesses that end up employing a vast majority of the people. Government cannot employ all of these people. Right? So with the vocational thing in the educational system, with the ease of doing business reforms, you can see how these are integrated with one another. Yeah. Right? Um, now, does it mean also that these individuals, to the extent that they are not educated, that they cannot be useful to society? No, they can be. But we have to find ways in which they can in a way that is not inimical to the interests of the people and the inimical to the, to the um, well-being of other citizens. And to the extent that we can find opportunities for them to do that, we will deploy them in those and, and provide avenues for them. But what we are saying is that their activities presently are detrimental to our society in the way in which they are operating it. And we will not have it. We come back, we still continue our conversation with the governorship candidate of the African Democratic Congress, uh, Funsho Duarte. Please stay with us on News Up. We'll be right back. Rise in cases of kidnapping, banditry, coal clashes, bombings, and other acts of terror. It seems the current state of insecurity is relatively higher than ever before. Insecurity affects us all. It affects everything from our personal freedom, how we travel, from the cost of goods and services, to even our physical and mental health. Therefore, we have a duty to help security agencies protect us better wherever and whenever we can. If you see or hear something suspicious in your neighborhood, don't keep it to yourself, but be sure to say something to the right authorities. Remember, you could just be saving a life, and that life you save could be yours. This is a message from the Silverbird Group. down to crucial government. <laughs> I was going to say crucial governorship election, but they're all crucial. The general elections, whether it's the state uh, national assembly, a presidential governorship election, but we're focusing on the governorship election uh, in Lagos State. Elections in gov for the governorship will happen on the 11th of March. That's two weeks after the presidential election on the 25th of February next year. And Fushio Duarte 
the governorship candidate of the African Democratic Congress, and we've been having a very lively conversation this morning, um, touching the areas which are of great concern uh, to millions of uh, Lagosians. Yeah. And, um, and it's important that we've sort of, you know, moved in a certain direction as we move in towards the economy. And just before we went on the break, you talked about the ease of doing business. Yeah. This is, has been a sore area for a lot of investors and business men. People have oftentimes, you know, should they increase the taxes or should they increase the tax base? Um, it's been a very contentious subject. It appears that most times increasing the tax base has been difficult. Instead, they've increased the taxes on people. They've experimented a number of things. They have just one single taxation. But um, if you do a poll or if you go outside, people are really, really concerned about the rising cost of doing business yeah. in Lagos State. But is it true? No pain, no gain. So, um, well, I mean, they say no pain, no gain. But I think there's also a, a, an effective uh, and efficient way of doing things right. that, can, uh, that can get you more with less. What do I mean by that? Uh, first of all, I think we need to reduce the burden of, of regulation. Uh, on, on the small entities, right? Government should be supportive of getting those businesses off the ground and, and getting to that point where they can employ two, three, four people, right? Um, and we should reduce the impact of regulatory agencies, harassment on those small businesses, right? Yes, they should follow rules and be regulated and all of that, but the, the goal has to be to get them up and running, right? Um, now, Related to this area mm. is, is another area which is central to our own um, plans for government. Government itself needs to be reformed and the public sector needs to be reformed. Part of the problem that we have with some of these regulatory agencies is that there's predatory behavior going on, right, where some of the, uh, these agencies and the individuals within those agencies essentially use them as, as vehicles to prey on some of these young entities, right, and some of these business entities. And a lot of the time, the objective may not necessarily be to raise that revenue for government, mm. right? It's to harass, extort, right, and get, get basically those resources that ought to go to government mm. end up in private pockets. Mm. Part of that and the way you fix that is to ensure that, and this is part of our comprehensive program of reform in government. One, you have to compensate government workers well. And we have a cardinal objective of ensuring that everybody who works for Lagos State ultimately gets well compensated through a program of bringing their compensation up to reasonable levels. When you do that, you insist that people approach their jobs with integrity and with accountability, mm -hmm. right? and then you have the enforcement mechanisms to ensure that people do that. That enables you to tackle corruption, self-interest, self-dealing in the public sector. We'll strengthen the Attorney General's office, we'll strengthen the instruments of surveillance, the audit mechanisms, the rules around conflict of interest, the rules of service. By the way, none of these things involves the passage of new laws. All of these exist in the laws and in the regulations governing the public service. But we'll insist that those things are done. And we'll put the mechanisms in place that you will find in the best of private sector organizations mm -hmm. to prevent untoward behavior. And as a foundation for doing this, we will set the tone from the top. Because as anybody who has run an organization, state, nation of any size knows, that the rot starts from the top. And anything that is good will also start from the top. So we will insist that those who are in positions of authority, from the governor all the way down, hold themselves to the same standard that they, that they are expecting of, of, the, of the public service workers. And you will find, as we do this, that government then becomes an entity that makes decisions in every sphere of life, in every sector, decisions that are driven not by personal interest, but by public interest. Right? And we will see that reflected. Now, to bring it back to your question of taxes, um, <clears throat> you know, they say in life that the only two things that are certain in life is death and taxes, right? right. Yeah. So we're not coming in to say that there will not be taxes. But we are saying that your you tax system needs to be equitable. 
It is one of the, it, there needs to be justice in the implementation of, ta of a tax system. So when we look at the tax system in Lagos, for example, are the people who are earning the most, paying the most? Can we say that with, in, in, with confidence? Can we say that all the folks who, with, from whom we ought to be collecting money, whether companies or individuals, by the way, at the high end of the scale, are paying the taxes that they should? Are they being harassed in the same way that the small businesses are being harassed? Which is easier to accomplish? To harass them in the exactly. same way or to have a more friendly approach? No, no. So what I'm saying is that you start with the friendly approach. But you also have, it's not, it's not a carrot and carrot. That note doesn't work anywhere in the world. Mm. It's carrot and stick. stick. Right? And by the way, those guys have the means and the influence with government. Mm. Do you understand? Mm. So we're not saying, and we're not creating any new taxes. We're, not, we're just saying implement the law equitably. Mm. Right? Because then you can then get to the point where you say, and believe me, you may find that by doing this, your IGR actually right. goes up. I'm sorry, David. And by the way, you can right. use this and then becomes a, a tool which in, in concert with the people and the assembly in the state, we can think about how we think about redistributive mechanisms, yeah. right. right? Perhaps reducing the burden on the, the, the lowest on the kidder. You see what I mean? Why, why I bring this up? Because I use this as an example. What happened with the Lekki toll gate, for yes, example, yes. that they call bridge. There's been thinking that, you know, the, the guys at the upper end of the spectrum get a better deal than those at the lower end. And so, so for example, they say the tolling of uh, the lucky toll, for example, was, was unfair to a certain group of people and, and to others. It was, you know, that, that sort of thing. And the state government up till now still hasn't been able to open those uh, gates, despite mm -hmm. reports and all of that that have been put in place. Mm -hmm. well, what's your perception? You, you think? Well, I mean, you know, I think some of the time when you see those kinds of things, sometimes they are almost like, um, I don't know whether regressive is the word because, you know, essentially everybody's paying the same toll, right? right? But people do not earn the same things. Do you see what I mean? So it's always better when you have mechanisms that um, sort of are equitable in the sense that those who earn the most pay the most and those who need help get help, right? Mm -hmm. And in a well-functioning tax system, right, in a prosperous society, you may not need to go and start tolling all over the place, right? If you, if if the society is operating, you may have one or two toll roads, yeah. in maybe in key particular places, mm -hmm. but the government doesn't have to be built on a system of tolling roads, right? If you have basically a system that works, a system that is prosperous, a system that generates growth and wealth, mm -hmm. right? And then the tax system is operating properly, right? And then you can then partner with private sector um, as well for some of these things. So um, ultimately, I think that um, if we lay the foundation right, for the, the, a Lagos we want, which is a, a mega city of the future, uh, that is a prosperous society, not a society where the resources are concentrated in a few, but where the resources of the state are used to develop the state such that wealth spreads, spreads across the state. Then the society is prosperous. And then you have less need for these what I call ad hoc interventions. Do you, you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I think that that's where we ought to be going with Lagos. And this is the problem that we have, actually, when you look at the last 25 years and the governance of Lagos over the last 25 years. Because we feel it has been a a period when you've had a sharp increase in the concentration of wealth within the state in a narrow group at the expense of a broader group. And we think a large part of that has to do with the actions of government over the 25 year period that we're speaking about. And we think that if you move in the direction of better leadership and better government anchored by a reform of the government and the public service. The effect 25 years from now, which by the way, 25 years is a generation. So we've given a generation. Yeah. We don't want to be sitting here 25 years from now, and I know I'm unlikely to be sitting here. You might, 
Well, you know, oh, you, you may be, be you may be like you may be like Larry King, you know. I mean, you know. The eighties, you know. So, still there. <laughs> so, but but the point the point the point is that we don't want to be having the same discussion. You know, we need to be our idea is to move Lagos in the next generation into the first world. Yes, I'm still staying with that conversation. The, the state government just had. Um, an economic summit sometime last yes. week, which they called the Aingbeti yes. uh, summit. Yes, and, I saw um, that. It, it did bring out um, a master plan, yes. you know, a 30, 30 year master plan yes. that's meant to run till 2052. Uh, yes. uh, fantastic um, um, idea, you think? Do you Look, have a concerns around it? Uh, not just concerns. I am, I am, I am very fearful mm. because if somebody or a group runs something for 25 years. And at the end of that period, we compare that city to other cities across the world. And we say it is the last but one, after a generation. I'm not expecting that those people to come to me with another 30-year plan, which I will now buy into, to see whether what they did not do in the last 25 years, they are going to accomplish in the next 30 years. No. You've had enough time to prove uh, the outcomes. Um, this is not the time to sign on for another, another generation. Um, uh, we think that there's time for new thinking, uh, time for a new direction for Lagos. It doesn't mean that we will take the existing plans and throw everything away. No. Government is a continuum, right? But we will assess it. Whatever works, we will keep, perhaps with modification. Whatever does not work, we will not, we do, we do not, we're not vested in sustaining something that does not work because we were the ones that brought it. No, we will remove it. So that at the end of the day, what we want for Lagos, which is to move it into the first world in the next generation, we can accomplish for Lagos. Lagos should lead. Lagos should lead. As Lagos goes, so Nigeria will go, ultimately. Mm. As Lagos goes, so will Lagos go. So will Nigeria go ultimately. If you look at what the dynamics that are playing out on the political, on the presidential level now, right, including the contest for the presidency, right, part of why we are seeing what we are seeing there is because of what has happened in Lagos over the last 25 years. It's partly what is resulting in the dynamics that are playing out at the presidential level. And that will continue to be the case because of the unique situation that Lagos occupies, yeah. where it is a center of commercial activity, a center of power, a center of economic influence that is outside of the presidential complex. Right. And uh, with Lagos, we anchor this morning's show uh, news up. Thank you very much, uh, Funcho Duarte, the governorship candidate of the African Democratic Congress. Wish you uh, all the best on your campaign trail. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, we look forward to having you again sometime. Thank you. Sometime, Thank you. most definitely. I appreciate it. All right, that's our show today. A fantastic um, show we've had all the way from 7 a.m. up until um, 9, 40, 50. It's been wonderful. Thank you all our, our viewers, our listeners, and um, our callers and our guests. We appreciate you a great deal. Uh, we have to run now. I am David Babrike. Do have yourself a fantastic uh, week. Yes, it's a new week. So do have a fantastic day and a fantastic week. And I am our, our boy. We're going to need for this week a lot of Ura. Shush! Aye, Kwaheri, yeah.